Uh, today's speaker is Jay Shallon. And before I introduce him, I want to take just a moment to underline the importance of today's topic, schools and education. The ideas taught in our nation and schools have far-reaching far consequences. The ideas that are promulgated there end up in our K-12 classrooms. And so I know that some of you probably, this may be your first time coming to an event that is about higher education, but it really has a far more uh, extensive consequence. Every student who goes through the public school system will be exposed to the ideas that are popular in our education schools. So if those ideas are political or outdated or simply incorrect, it will affect millions of children every year. Jay's work to expose this politicization is extremely important. And I hope that all of you, when you leave here today, will take a copy of the report, which we have at, at the back table and several copies over here as well. And we also have copies available, or, or PDFs available on our website if you prefer to read the electronic copies. So I encourage you to take copies with you, share them with your friends, um, and share them with anyone you think would be interested. Uh, and now to introduce our speaker. Jay and I both joined the Martin Center in the same year, 2007. So we've been colleagues for a long time now. Uh, Jay is originally from Philadelphia. He began his writing career as a freelance journalist at the Asbury Park Press. He wrote for several other papers in Delaware and New Jersey. He also worked as a software engineer at Computer Sciences Corporation. He has a BS in Computer Science from Richard Stockton College in New Jersey and an MA in Economics from the University of Delaware. Jay's articles have appeared in Forbes, The Washington Times, Fox News Online, U.S. News and World Report, Investors Business Daily, Human Events, and American Thinker, as well as many other papers too numerous to name. His op-eds have been published by the McClatchy News Service and the Raleigh News and Observer here closer to home. He has been interviewed on ESPN, National Public Radio, and UNC UNCTV, and his work has been featured on ABC News and Fox News as The O'Reilly Factor. Uh, Jay is a member of the National Association of Scholars and is, on, and is on the board of directors of the Academy of Philosophy and Letters. So now I hope you will help me welcome Jay Shallon. Science is not universal, but depends on culture. Race and gender are social constructs. Meritocracy is biased. Specific knowledge is unimportant. What only skills matter. Dates, events, and names are unnecessary for the study of history. This is some of the wisdom being promoted in our schools of education, taught in varying degrees to our future elementary and high school teachers. These teachers then pass them on to their students. In this process, gradually over the generations, our country's way of thinking is being transformed. I'm not saying there's some kind of hidden agenda to take over our education system. I'm saying that the agenda is out in the open for anybody who actually wants to see it. Of course, not everybody wants to see it. Um, many educators are probably unaware of the agenda behind the ideas they promote. They simply feel they're the best thing around, or maybe they were never exposed to any other type of uh, thinking. But if you read what top educators write for each other, and if you follow the historical thread of ideas that are now front and center in our schools of education, the agenda becomes clear. And uh, for this thing, I'm going to start with a historical account of how we got to this point. The leftist takeover of our education system started over 100 years ago, at the height of the progressive era. American education was far from perfect before then, and it certainly could have used some improvement from experts. But instead of experts who tried to build on what was good about American education, they got experts who created from these newly created schools of education who wanted to make the United States to a more scientific, more utilitarian, more centrally planned, and more collective society. They saw themselves as social engineers who would plan and design this new society. As the National Education Association described it back then, they were building a new social. The most influential progressives were, in many cases, open socialists. 
Some visited the Soviet Union and came back filled with praise for Joe Stalin's nightmare. But as a rule, they did not directly introduce leftist politics into the schools. What they really did was sweep away the best of the old style of American education that tried to connect students to the traditional culture and to elevate their characters. One example is how they got rid of the old McGuffey readers that had earlier generations of students reading at a high level right from the start. The McGuffey readers were filled with classic myths, fairy tales, biblical stories, important history, historical documents, and essays, and more. They taught much more than learning to read, they inspired. The, rep the progressives replaced them with the Elson readers. That's the old C. Dick Run series that used simple words and familiar activities. By ridding our schools of their cultural components in favor of content-free skill building, the progressives created a moral and cultural void that today's radical educators are able to exploit. Eventually, the early progressives got their hat in, hats handed to them by reality, but the damage had been done. And they were followed by a more diabolical threat, cultural Marxism. World War II was de devastating for many old school communists, despite their success in the Soviet Union. Marxist predictions that soldiers would reject nationalism for revolutionary class warfare and turn their guns on their upper class officers failed to materialize. The younger generation of Marxists theorized that traditional ideals were too deeply ingrained in the culture for communism to take root. Apparently, uh, many Westerners were bitter clingers even back then. The new Marxists decided that they had to remake Western man first, and it had to be done gradually and subversively. One of cultural Marxis, Marxism's founding fathers was Georg Lukács. He was the assistant deputy commissar for culture and I'll just stop and ask, have you ever heard a more chilling, bureaucratic <laughs> title than that? In, and this was in Hungary's failed communist government in 1990. He used his position to conduct what he described as cultural terrorism on Hungary's education system, starting with introducing sex education into the curriculum. Lukács helped to found a communist think tank, the Institute for Social Research in Frankfurt, Germany. There, the psychological theories of Sigmund Freud and other social scientists were elevated to the equal status with those of Karl Marx. The synthesis produced a strategy in which the state would be converted incrementally to collectivism through education and popular culture rather than through confrontational economic warfare. The Frankfurt School, as it became known, was driven out of Germ Germany, and um, just our luck, they set up shop here. Eventually, um, others, and most notably Paulo Freire, a Brazilian educator, um, built on their educational theories, and uh, they adopted the term critical pedagogy. This is because the underlying epistemology of the Frankfurt School is called critical theory. And I, whenever you see critical as kind of this prefix word to uh, something in politics or education, there's a chance that it somehow has a lineage going back to the Frankfurt, Frankfurt School. One of today's top critical pedagogy theorists, UCLA professor Peter McLaren, wrote that the curriculum should be viewed as a form of cultural politics. He also wrote that one of critical pedagogy's foundational tenets is that knowledge should be analyzed on the basis of whether it is oppressive or exploitative, not on the basis of whether it is true. For the most part, Frankfurt School members theorized in obscurity until the late 1950s. Um, at that time, other strains of the American left were collapsing, and uh, cultural Marxism was in a perfect position to fill the room. One Frankfurt School member, Herbert Marcuse, and I never know how to say that, became known as the father of the new left 
the intellectual movement that led the upheaval of the 1960s. It is no accident that Angela Davis and Abby Hoffman were his students at Rambass. Mark Hughes recognized that Western workers could not be relied on to be the vanguard of the revolution. They were too busy enjoying the prosperity created by capitalism to bring it down. Marcuse wrote that a newer, angrier vanguard should be created from, and I'll quote, the substratum of the outcasts and outsiders, the exploited and persecuted of other races and other colors, the unemployed and the unemployed. Now, this focus on alienated identity groups brings us to the most important and effective school of thought for implementing the less transformation of society through education. That is multicultural. Uh, their timing was perfect. Uh, the civil rights movement that demanded inclusion for black Americans was in full swing. And at the same time, there was a growing part of black America that was less concerned about inclusion than racial pride and identity. Multiculturalism satisfies both needs. It offers African Americans a seat at the table as equals, and at the same time allows them to remain a separate people. But multiculturalism is also essentially anti-American. It alters the citizens' traditional and formal relationships to the state by replacing individual rights as the basic building block of society with the rights of various identity groups. And um, so multicultural was sort of nurtured by the new left and academics and, and uh, cultural Marxist academics, and it rapidly gained uh, other ethnic and sexual factions. Um, and I, as far as I can tell, it might be the leading social theory of our time, at least in education. Multicultural education has grown increasingly radical over time. At first, it focused on including the achievements of minorities in the curriculum in a positive way, which is certainly not a problem. But by the 1990s, multiculturalists were starting to remake the curriculum in, in drastic and alarming ways. No longer would young Americans be taught from an American or Western perspective. Instead, they would be taught from the perspective of those who are perceived to be victims of American or Western oppression. For instance, one leading multicultural educator suggested that a U.S. history unit called the Western Movement should be renamed the Invasion from the East to reflect a Native American perspective. Multiculturalist education is also promoting activism to advance its uh, political causes. In the last few years, and I noticed a few school districts across the country that have started giving high school students time off for credit for attending political protests. And make no mistake, uh, as multicultural advocates increasingly gain control, they will not be gentle. One of its leading uh, champions, um, Christine Sleever wrote that working for ju social justice dash redistribution of the world's resources is at the heart of what multicultural education should be at that. And I think we're most people in this room are pretty aware of what that means in societies held bent on redistribution. And now it's time to see how influential the ideas of these radical educators are in today's ed schools. So, one of the empirical side of my report. For my main method, I use syllabi from three major education schools, the universities of Michigan, Wisconsin, and North Carolina. And this was to see which authors and publications are being assigned as a way of determining which ideas are most prevalent. And uh, I can keep this simple. Uh, what I discovered was that generally the most frequently assigned authors subscribe to either crit critical pedagogy or multiculturalism or some combination of the two. And my study is not the only one. Um, I haven't seen a lot of similar research, but I did find two other studies 
that address this topic in a similar fashion. Both of the principal researchers are political moderates. One is Frederick Hess, uh, the lead educational expert at the American Enterprise Institute. And the other is David Steiner, director of the John Hopkins Institute for Education Policy. And both of their studies corroborate my work strongly. So anyway, who are these most widely read educators and what do they believe? For the first part of the question, the most common authors are not obscure academics. They are among the biggest names in education. They are deans of education schools, directors of institutes with generous funding, department heads, trustees of state university systems, editors of top academic journals, recipients of prestigious awards for their scholarship and writing, and in one case, an advisor to President Obama. They are not from the fringes. They are the education establishment. For example, the most frequently assigned author across all three schools is Gloria Gladson Billings. She is the Associate Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, and she formerly served as the Chair of the Department of Curriculum and Instruction in Wisconsin's Education School, and that is the that school is ranked second among all education schools in the country. She is currently the president of the National Academy of Education and for 2005 and 6 was president of the American Educational Research, Research Association. Not exactly a nobody. As far as the second part of the question about their beliefs goes, in general, the most frequently assigned writers are far to the left of your ordinary modern literature. Let's take Gladstone Billing, Billings again. She is described as a groundbreaker in the fields of culturally relevant pedagogy and critical race theory. She has stated that we educators should align our scholarship with the philosophy of Marcus Garvey, race first. There are also a bunch of recognizable names among the frequently assigned authors. Um, I cherry picked a few of them, such as John Dewey, W.E.B. Du Bois, Paolo Frere, Howard Zinn, and Bill Ayers. And uh, all five are about socialists or communists. Um, I also looked at the faculty at UNC Chapel Hill. One measure I used is voter registrations of professors. There are 52 education school faculty members listed as tenured or tenure track on the UNC website, at least at the time I did. I was stunned to find out that 30 are registered as Democrats, 10 are unaffiliated, 10 are not registered, and two are Republicans. The reason I was stunned is that there were any Republicans at all, <laughs> not because of the 15 to 1 balance. But not to worry, the situation is not as dire as it seems. The two Republicans are both in their 60s, so they'll be gone in a few years. <laughs> UNC Ed School website also provided professors research and teaching interests. 27 of the 52 professors pr expressed an interest in topics that indicate at least some politicization. And just like with voting registration, the assistant professors, whose current beliefs predict the future faculty consensus, were much more political than their older counterparts. Now here's a couple examples of who's teaching at Chapel Hill Ed School. There's Brian Gibbs, an assistant professor, and he quotes from Angela Davis to start his personal department web page. His interests include critical pedagogy, social justice and democratic education, teacher disposition, positionality, and I don't know what that is, and ideology, teacher education, justice-oriented school leadership, and the ominous-sounding school transformation. And then there's Eileen Parsons, a full professor whose interests include socio-cultural dimensions of science learning, broadening participation in STEM, African-American education, 
cultural relevance and cultural responsiveness in science education, racial equity, and critical race theory. Now, note her connection of culture to science education. She is teaching that science is dependent upon the background of students rather than comprised of universal principles. And note that I said full professor. She has been given tenure and promoted while spouting this stuff. And there are plenty more just like those two, probably at every education school in the UNC system. A few alarming examples of what's going on our, in our public schools uh, can be directly mapped from ideas circulating in the schools of education. Locally, Wake County is proposing to greatly reduce the number of disciplinary suspensions in high schools because there is a large racial disparity. And one very popular article that I saw in uh, the education schools is titled, The Achievement Gap and the Discipline Gap, Two Sides of the Same Coin. And that article advances the idea of equalizing suspensions among races without a whole lot of regard for individual actions. Then there is the Edina, Minnesota School District, and that's kind of like Minneapolis's carry. A couple of years ago, Edina school, High School transformed its curriculum to promote racial and gender equality. The English course required of all 10th graders now focuses on colonization, immigration, and social constructions of race, class, and gender. One student on the Rate My Teachers website said, this class should be renamed White Males Are Bad and How Oppressive They Are. <laughs> Many of the arguments for this changing curriculum seem to mirror the growing body of, uh, you know, the stuff written in the growing body of education literature that focuses on whiteness. Every week it seems like there's a new outrage in K-12 education in this country, just like those two. Um, in Seattle, kindergartners and first graders are read a book about a bear named Teddy, who would rather be called Tilly. And um, I recently became aware of the new teachers group, Red for Ed, which promotes socialism, and I think it's now in about 10 states. The way things are, um, uh, let's see. Um, now, so what can be done? And my honest opinion is that it's not good. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good with coming up with solutions. I struggle with it. Um, Certainly, there's not an easy fix. Um, it sort of seems like, at least in UNC and Wisconsin, a serious critical mass has been reached, and there's not going to be much turning back. Reform is definitely not coming from within. Um, after all, academic departments run pretty much on a consensus of faculty, and real reform is going to require dismissal of much of the fact. The way things are now, higher education system of shared governance, tenure, and academic freedom makes all but the most minor reforms almost impossible. Also, the creative free market solutions in education we're familiar with, uh, from homeschooling to school choice to alternative institution building, sort of seem inadequate at the scale needed. Um, homeschooling and private schooling often require exceptional parents of ample means. The great mass of students are going to be taught in public schools by education school graduates for the foreseeable future. And what good is school choice if you're just shifting students from one set of education school trained teachers to another? Students may do better in math and reading and science in a system of choice and charter schools, but they will still be subject to political indoctrination unless the education tie, the ties to education schools are tied. And I know you're going to have, every once in a while, there's going to be some sort of conservative uh, charter school or something, uh, like Bob Luddy runs one. Uh, but that's not the majority. Um, 
and uh, let's see, even homeschooling, which does cut a lot of the ties between the ed schools and the students, is increasingly subject to regulations and teaching materials created by education school trained bureaucrats. It seems as fast as we can come up with alternatives, they can come up with counters to those alternatives. The progressives and cultural Marxists understood how important control of education is in determining the direction of society. They are now conducting a sort of cultural terrorism similar to that conducted by Georg Lukács back in 1919. It may be impossible for the right and center to conduct the same sort of gradual subversion that the left did. The left rarely drops their guard, and they are all politics all the time. The one hope I have is political, and it's sort of shaky, but it has to start with more awareness by our political leaders. After all, they're the ones that allow the current state of affairs to develop. They need to realize just how crucial it is to reverse the ideological direction of our education system. And that doing so starts in the education schools. They must also realize that limiting themselves to current governance practices may prove ineffective. Somehow they kind of have to find the courage to figuratively blow up the education schools in order to save education. Thank you.